Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special Tortoises event. Um, it's a terribly sultry, hot evening, and thank you all for taking time out from melting to, to join us here. Um, you've made a wise decision because uh, you have a very special evening, I think, with someone who um, I'm not remotely ashamed of. It's a bit of a hero of mine, Matt Haig. Um, and he's here to talk to us about his brilliantly novel, The Midnight Library. Uh, but I'm sure we'll talk about other things as well, because uh, Matt has an amazing range of uh, subjects that he can talk about, and uh, mental health, of course, but also uh, all sorts of uh, contemporary and indeed scientific issues that he knows about. Um, and I want to involve as many of you as possible, so please uh, do raise your hands on the um, um, on the usual way on, on the participants uh, um, button and, and if you want to join in the chat uh, my colleague and fellow editing partner Liz Mosey will be navigating that and we will keep an eye on that to make sure that uh, if, there's, if there's anything you want to um, chip in uh, either raise your hand or I'll keep an eye on the chat and bring you in because um, I'm sure you'll have things you want to talk to Matt about. Um, so, I, I want to uh, not waste any more time on me and to get straight into uh, what Matt has done and this latest uh, this many books. Um, first of all, welcome Matt, thank you. Um, the Midnight Library, uh, before we get into talking about what, what's, what it's about, its origins, um, I think it's, it's sort of worth backtracking a bit and saying that though, uh, you know, a, particularly since uh, Reasons to Stay Alive, your wonderful book came out in 2015, you, you've been very closely and rightly associated with discussions of mental health and so on. Actually, in a way, you, 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 are, you are in origin and as a writer, a novelist, aren't you? Yes, uh, absolutely, yes, Reasons to Stay Alive. Many people think it was my first book, but it was, I think, if, you, if you're factoring in everything, uh, about my 10th or 11th, actual book out there. So yes, my first non-fiction was my 10th book overall. And before that, I, I had written um, fiction for adults and also some children's stories too. And Reasons to Stay Alive, I still write obviously fiction as well, but Reasons to Stay Alive sort of uh, came in 2015, I think, and I'd been published since 2004. So I, I'd done my dues as the struggling writer um, for quite a while. So, uh, I don't want to give away too much of, about the novel uh, because I want people to read it and, 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 and enjoy it in its entirety. It's a, it's a, you know, a genuine page turner. But just to give a, a basic flavour of it, concerns uh, an, a, a, a very unhappy woman, Nora Seed, who is living in Bedford and finds herself you know, really running out of reasons to live. Um, she makes an attempt on her life and suddenly finds herself transported to an extraordinary um, and inexplicable library that seems to contain a, an infinite number of books, that each of which contains a possible life that she might have led, um, in which potentials of all sorts are explored. And in the book, again, without giving it away too much, pursues a uh, passage through number of these books and what then happens. So I suppose if the first question to ask is, you know, how, how did that structural idea come to you? Um, well, I've wanted to write about parallel lives for a long time. A lot of the books and films I'm interested in and have always liked have been parallel live, uh, um, you know, at the heart, had parallel lives as a central concept. And um, I'm fascinated, you know, in the science of parallel universes and quantum physics and how science is becoming more and more uncertain. And there's more and more ambiguity rather than less as, as, as we, we learn more about physics. I, I, I love that from a sort of creative standpoint. Um, but I didn't really have a hook. I didn't have a hook until about two years ago where I came up with the library as a sort of perfect metaphor you know libraries have been used a lot in very in realistic fiction from sort of Agatha Christie using them for um 
the, for the perfect place to have a corpse in the library. And then you've got, you know, all kinds of magical realist libraries out there. Um, but, you know, when I had the idea that each book would be a version of her life, I thought, okay, yes, I've got it now. This is the one I should do as my um, next book because I just liked that concept of being able to enter a library where every single book is another world, but each of those world world stars you because it's how you could have lived your life if you'd have made um, different decisions. And I'm, and I think it goes back. I mean, obviously, it's a novel about mental health to the extent that the central character herself is going through um, depression at the start of the novel. But also, I think for me, when I've had my own mental health issues in the past, it's often been, uh, you know, the flavour of depression for me often relates to regret. And there isn't always a, a logic to that. Um, it can simply be the regret that you have depression and wishing you had done something different health-wise um, or, you know, in your life um, to end up in a different place. But I, I, I feel like that feeling of regret you know it's such a wasteful feeling and it's one i feel we're almost encouraged to feel increasingly in the internet age sometimes or at least we're encouraged to sort of compare our life to other lives um on a bigger scale i suppose because the numbers have have gone up and we're in this sort of comparison culture so a lot of that was um feeding into it as well so i was writing it as a kind of self-therapy um, for myself, which is always a good uh, reason, I think, to write a book. It means you'll stick with it and you're actually writing it um, for you first and foremost and therefore hoping that other people um, relate to it too. So um, what, what I think is, is, is one of the many reasons that the book works as brilliantly as it does is that it is a novel which has, I mean, clearly it has mental health as part of its imaginative spine and it's yeah. in its DNA, but it's not a mental health book. Um, you know, you know, it's 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 this is not a manual. This is not a uh, a thinly you know a, a kind of manual with a thin layer of fiction laid over it at all. This is a you know it is a page turn, uh, which is quite hard because you you know you've, you've managed to um, get those themes into a, a compelling narrative. And I just wonder when you were writing it, were you conscious of the the, the, you know, the tension between those two things. Yes, definitely. Um, but I like that tension. I like the fact that you're not meant to, you're either meant to write an exciting adventure story, a sort of commercial, what they dismissively call an airport novel, um, probably not so much this year, but you know, the, the beach read idea. Or you have a thinky book, or you have your highbrow kind of book a book, and you know, never between shall meet you either have a book of ideas or you have a book of adventure and page turning um nature and i i always just i always feel like that's a false dichotomy that we've created and a relatively you know in human literature terms a relative recent split that we've had for about the last century um and, and why not just create something which can make you um think but also entertain you and the, and the thinking can be part of the entertainment I, I with this i suppose i was also trying to create i wasn't trying to be because the, the the structure itself is quite conceptual i was trying to make everything around it quite easy and simple it wasn't necessarily easy for me writing it and all my editors structuring it but i wanted because we've got a lot of quantum physics in there and stuff i wanted to see if we could translate these ideas in in a, in, in a sort of comforting way a way you know almost like the bookish equivalent of a pop song way where, where Parts of it feel familiar, and then parts of it sort of surprise you, and uh, and, and mix it all together. So, um, looking at the whole issue of regret again, I mean, uh, it does seem to me that that's sort of again uh, part of the emotional part of the book, and Nora's attempts to come to terms with, and to some extent, if not uh, you know, completely forget about, if you can't forget about such things, but to try and uh, release yourself from the burden of that. Is that, do you think, as one gets older, that's something that plays a bigger part, which is to try and, you know, try not to be overtaken by regret. And also just to pick up on your social media point, it, it is getting harder, isn't it, to to escape the, mm. the, the, 
the errors and the follies of the past. Yes, absolutely. It, yes, in terms of uh, l we are all leaving a trace. We're all growing up uh, and evolving in public. And um, people, especially if you're even vaguely in the public eye, people love to play gotcha and, and, and say you, you once tweeted this drunkenly in 2012 after a late night in the pub and um, we'll, we'll judge your whole personality on that one, one moment. Um, yeah, so, so, so there's that. But I also think in terms of the numbers of the internet, I, I'm fascinated. I think it was um, a social anthropologist uh, from Oxford called Roger Dunbar who came up with Dunbar's number being 150. 150 being the amount of people in a community when human beings organize themselves naturally. So in Neolithic communities and all the, in the Doomsday Book as well, the average size of a village was roughly around 150 people apparently. And this carried on all the way through to the end of the 18th century um, where villages were still the main form of human community. Um, it would be a, around 150 people, which of course meant that the average person in their lifetime would only really encounter um, in any meaningful way about 150 other human beings during their whole life. Now, of course, we're in an age where we could go on Instagram in bed before breakfast and easily encounter 150 new faces and new people and new lives in front of us. And they wouldn't be the lives that are the, the average cross section we would meet in the old Neolithic village. It would be exceptional people. It'd be the people with 5 million followers. It'd be the, uh, you know, champion footballers or the Olympic swimmers or the pop stars or the exceptionally conventionally beautiful people or whoever it is. So we're, it's very easy, I think nowadays to feel slightly like, oh, is, is my life enough? I, I, why am I like this and why are they like that? You know, if Kim, Kim Kardashian is t tweeting about, oh, she did an Instagram post last year um, where Kanye West um, had hired Kenny G, you know, the ja light jazz saxophonist yeah. for, for Valentine's Day uh, and had, had laid on this um, concert um, for his wife um, with, with the most expensive um, jazz musician in America. And if you're sort of at the bus shelter with your soggy um, Clinton's cards, Valentine's Day card, and then you're looking at that, it's inevitable you'll, you'll start to feel a little bit um, less or a little bit inadequate, or should I be doing this? Should I be um, kidnapping Kenny G and... Um, for my partner. So I feel like we're in this continual age where we're comparing ourselves to other people, but also part of it, I think, is, is a bit deeper than that. It's almost like we're comparing ourselves to ourselves. We're comparing our actual internal self to this magazine version of ourselves, which we're continually putting out there. We're, we're constantly having to represent ourselves um, to the world almost to exist. And it's interesting because, you know, again, without giving way too much of the plot, a number of the uh, lives into which Nora is propelled, you know, are, are ones of huge and in some cases global success. And that seems to me to, to speak quite sharply to the sort of contemporary idea of, um, of multiple identities. And, and as you say, the, the sense of, um, of almost limitless possibility, which is sometimes cruel in social media the idea that if if only i had done this i could be michael jordan or beyonce or you know, um barack obama or whatever and and um there's a kind of in commoditization of the self if you like that 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 we the, these are things we should have been we, we could have been yes and reality tv as well which obviously predates social media um, reality TV as a format, you know, the format essentially is saving someone from their ordinary background in the north with a nan and, you know, they're, they're, they'll do the footage of them on the bus and, and then, you know, Simon Cowell will wave a magic wand and then they'll have their lives ultimately transformed by winning a um, 
reality TV contest. And all of this, like, like ordinary life is something to be saved from, you know, to be saved from in, you know, via the gloss and glamour and wealth of celebrity. And we kind of know on, in the abstract sense that's a load of nonsense. But I, I think, you know, there's so much, so much it's so pervasive that, especially for young people, the, the sort of values of that, of that sort of like unrealistic dream. So it doesn't matter how many celebrity suicides we see. It doesn't matter how many people we see in rehab. It doesn't matter how many celebrities we see on um, TV sofas talking about um, depression and battling addictions and something. It's still presented as, as salvation in a sort of subliminal way. You, you say in the book, or, or characters do, that um, you don't have to understand life, you just have to live it. Um, it's actually a very profound um, statement and I just wondered if you can unpack that a bit for us because it, it, it's, it contains a lot in it. Um, yeah, I, I think again, you know, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session, but I think again it comes back from my experience of um, depression. I, I mean, for those that don't know, I won't bore you with the details, but when I was 24 years old, um, I fell into a quite a severe breakdown. I had depression, agoraphobia, panic disorder, the whole smorgasbord of um, mental health problems at that time. And it took me a long time. It took me about three years to get into a, a relatively uh, normal state again. And, you know, I, I'm not 100% better. I don't think I'll ever be 100% better, but I'm better comparatively. And also I've known far more happier happiness this side of um, my breakdown than I ever did as a, as a young person. So I don't regret it, you know, I'm a subject of regret. I wouldn't want to relive it, but I, you know, so, so much goodness has come out of that in terms of me being grateful um, for things. And I've sort of discovered myself through that. So I, I think it's about time. I think, I feel like um, when I was ill, um, depression gave me a very, pessimistic outlook obviously but a very certain outlook and it, it it told me for instance when i was 24 that i would definitely not make it to be 25 yeah. that my partner would definitely leave me that this that and the other would happen that i'd never be able to financially support myself because i was still you know such a mess and this that and the other and of course bit by bit time slowly disproves a lot of what depression says Yes, of course, life isn't a bed of roses and all kinds of, we know all kinds of grief and loss and struggle in, in the course of a life. But that worldview that depression gives you of total um, claustrophobic pessimism, that's as false as the sort of fakest, cheeriest optimism. You know, that, that just isn't life, you know. And often, um, not to get too Buddhist about it, but often the joy and the despair are kind of interconnected. You know, one comes out of, um, the other. So I, I feel like you don't necessarily know that in the moment. You have to kind of live and hold on um, if you're in a state of depression. You have to actually just trust time. There has to be some part of you that trusts that this will not be the way it's always going to be. And that, you know, takes a lot of courage and a lot of faith ultimately to do, especially when your depression is so trying to convince you um, otherwise. Uh, but do you think that we overanalyze mental health at times you know we we, we 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 try and reduce it to a kind of um a kind of rubik's cube if you like that can be solved yeah well i like about dealing with it in a fiction is that you know dealing with it through art is somehow seems to me very authentic well, to be honest, I do find it more freeing to do that. You know, I, I don't ever want to write another book that directly looks at my um, mental health experience. If I write another nonfiction book, I won't say I won't write another nonfiction book, but it will not be um, an autobiographical look at me having a panic attack. I have done that and I do not want to do that again. And I, yes, and, and also, you know, there's, there's such a shift, continual shift in our understanding of mental health. And I think every 10 years, 10 years previously looks quite dated on this and the language changes all, all, all the time, which is one reason why I think we shouldn't um, police the sort of mental health language too much and, and worry about different terminology because that terminology changes. You know, it used to be melancholia, now it's depression. Probably neither of those words actually 
ca captures the existential feeling of it. But you're right, yeah, fiction, I think, and fiction and the fact that I was writing a female protagonist as well, who clearly wasn't me, it made it easier in a way to be more truthful somehow about um, experiences because it, the, the character clearly wasn't me. Um, thank you so much, Matt. I'd like to come to uh, Chris Garrard, if I may. I think, Chris, are you there? Uh, I'm not sure if we can get you on camera. Um, oh. Hi, Chris. Can you, you had a great question, uh, which I, uh, <laughs> much lesser version of which I was gonna pose to Matt, but your, your wording was much, much superior. So far away. Um, I'm gonna have to remember what the wording was now. It was about to that. But, um, <laughs> so it was, I think for, mind you, I'm not that young now, I'm in my thirties, but I think for young people, and I, I, I do sort of um, campaigning and activism with young people, and for that younger generation, and there are these bigger kind of phenomena like climate change, um, that we're much more conscious of like conflict and global politics and now a pandemic which is on a global scale. And how I, I guess particularly young people can engage and respond to those issues like through they have agency to affect some kind of change, but without being becoming overwhelmed and, and totally blocked in, in how they they do those things. And I think those points that um, you were making about the role of social media and um, that, that kind of comparison is I think encountering things like Black Lives Matter and, and so on and, and like I say about climate that there's this sense of responsibility and the obligation to have to try and tackle them and respond to them as individuals and I'm seeing a lot of young people who are burning out and, and struggling and I yeah I'd just be interested in your thoughts on around that. Yeah, I think the, uh, well, uh, it's probably true in terms of the, you know, the mental health statistics do um, suggest that the rate of anxiety disorders particularly are rising and rising, you know, often when, when people hear that, they say, well, that's possibly because we're talking about it more and therefore we're diagnosing more. Um, and I, I think there's a degree of that, definitely. But what's interesting is when you actually break down the statistics, the, um, the particular mental health conditions that are rising the most are, are the ones that still have a lot of stigma. Um, you know, th things like eating disorders, self-harm, things which were relatively measurable as well in the past. You know, it, it, it's harder to disguise an eating disorder, even though you want to, than um, depression sometimes. So, so it, 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 it does seem like there's something happening with young people. I, I, I've never really thought about it in relation to the sort of political situation in, uh, in terms of that. But I feel like, you know, the more all of us are spending plugged in to computers continually and to Twitter and, yeah, I mean, 2020 is a particularly um, horrendous year in terms of world events, but the fact that it's, it's also the way we absorb it, isn't it? So I, I think people who've only known that, um, it, 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 the world can very easily feel um, overwhelming and they feel like, you know, that, you, they, they need to be plugged in all the time to it. And I've certainly struggled with that. At the start of a pandemic, I, I, I became a total um, news addict, uh, I, you know, just, just scrolling uh, mindlessly, Twitter 24 seven, going on all the news sites continually um, to no avail. And, and I really needed to sort of take a walk in the countryside and just absorb things a little bit more. Um, and I think, I think there's almost too much, too much coming at us. So it's a, it's a case of overload, I feel. It's almost like we're computers where there's too many frames open and you know, there's the political issues frame as the having to keep in contact all the time with, with our friends and our former school friends on Facebook and answer all the emails and everything's going on all at once. So it, it, people crash inevitably and we have a, like the spinning rainbow wheel. Um, inside themselves quite a lot. But I, I think, you know, it's not necessarily just a generational thing. I think obviously younger people who, who spend more time plugged into that um, probably experience it a bit more. Thanks, Matt. Uh, could we come to Susie Laxton next? If she's... Uh... Susie, hi. Welcome. Hi. Wow. Um, oh. Yeah, so this is Alfie, actually. Hi, Alfie. <laughs> Has Alfie um, got a question? Uh, yeah, Alfie has asked me 
to ask, um, Matt. Obviously, um, it says, but reasons to stay alive. That's quite a powerful title there. And I think my question was around now, if you did find yourself in a similar place where you were so low, depressed, um, I don't know if you mentioned agoraphobia and everything before, um, do you think you would now feel kind of an extra barrier or an extra kind of amount of reluctance to admit if you were struggling that badly? So if you were at the point of saying, oh my God, I actually would start, I am now thinking about ending my life again. Would you feel like prohibited oh, because, from saying that? Because I'd written reasons to stay alive. Yeah. Do you feel now like there's this pressure where you're like, no, it's okay, I can do this, you know, we can get through this. I wonder if there's, there'd be a barrier there for you um, in admitting that, despite the fact you've opened up the conversation yeah. and everything. That's a really good question, actually. And um, I don't know is the answer, but I, 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 you know, shortly after Reasons to Stay Alive was published, when the paperback came out, um, I had all my dreams come true because it was a number one bestseller. It was everything I'd been wanting, years plodding on, being dropped by publishers, carrying on. And, and it was a total dream come true. But because it was that book, because it was so such an exposing book, I felt suddenly very vulnerable and lots of people were treating me almost like a doctor or a Samaritan and they were coming to me filling up my inbox often people in quite a dreadful state people you kind of had a responsibility to get back to and I, I, I struggled with that new role all of a sudden and I fell into a patch of anxiety I, I, I spent the whole of that January sort of walking around my living room in circles not knowing what to do I, I felt oh my goodness this is it again I'm going to have another full-blown breakdown and, I, and there have been patches um, since 2015 where I've had dips of depression dips of anxiety but to be honest I actually think on balance it's possibly easier now for me to talk about it because reasons to stay alive itself was the first time I'd probably come out about my own internal stuff that I went through. And I, I did it deliberately, um, certainly as a man, to try and encourage other people who might feel reluctant to talk about mental health stuff. And I think because of the nature of the book, because I'm not actually saying I'm in a perfect place with all the answers. I'm not in a suicidal place, I'm in a better place, but I'm in a imperfectly human place still and there will never be some mental health nirvana that I will reach. I'm not like, you know, sitting under the tree meditating. Um, I think I think that was kind of the point of that book. It was to help people feel less alone and it actually helps me when I hear from other people who've gone through similar stuff. It, it, it therefore makes me feel like I was less of a freak or less strange um, for going through that. But yeah, I mean, you, you are right. You know, I, I, it, there is a certain kind of sense, like, like I, I did feel, like, oh, I better not tell anyone about this because they might think I'm a fraud because I've, I've written this book and I'm like the new, I don't know, Paul McKenna or something and I'm meant to have the answers to this. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's clearly not always the case. But I, I try and be as upfront and honest about that, about my mental health. You know, I have dips. I have health dips like many, many people all the time. And um, I don't always practice what I preach as well. It's easy to know the theory, isn't it? Matt, um, I'd, I'd love to ask you a question related to reading and writing, because in, in Reasons to Stay Alive, it was, you know, one of the, the very powerful points in it is the role that reading and kind of reading voraciously played in your recovery. Um, and, and now, of course, you know, writing has established you in a different way. And could, could you talk a bit about both reading and writing, particularly with respect to the Midnight Library, and how they compare with, if you like, the, the pressures of digital bombardment? Because it seems to me that, you know, there's, the, the, there's, there's one argument which says, actually, digital media are really just an extension of books and book writing, and they're not, they're not that different but I sense in your worldview that they are they're qualitatively different you know books are not the same as scrolling through Instagram to put it in its sort of crudest form well books don't expect that instant inter interaction you don't feel like you've got to 
um, have an emoji ready or click something or, uh, you know, scroll. There's not going to be a pop-up ad coming at you. And it feels like a kind of safe space away from that. So I, I, I would make a case that books actually, because of the internet age, are more valuable. And the statistics seem to be bearing that out, certainly this year. You know, uh, the book market in certain quarters is in quite a healthy um, state. And, you know, the internet hasn't killed the publishing industry yet. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's the oldest form of technology that we still have for a reason. And, and it, you know, it is interactive, but it's that deep level interaction, which we don't really get with the sort of um, cut and thrust of Twitter or the sort of passive scrolling of Instagram or Facebook or something. And so it's, it's, it's a, you know, its own thing. It, it is a kind of interaction, but it's that deep level interaction. You can be interacting with someone who died 300 years ago and having a very meaningful encounter. So I always resist the sort of cliche of the bookish people being introverts because it, 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 you know, reading books is a kind of socializing. It's just that sort of deep level socializing. Um, and for me, yeah, this year, I've probably read more than I normally do. And um, I, I've been reading without feeling like I, I need, therefore, to be writing. Often, as a writer, you, you, you feel like books are the fuel and you need to keep reading in order to keep writing. But I've actually been reading properly, where I'm just reading and absorbing and being very passive about it. And it's felt really good, actually. I've been reading all kinds of stuff, like, uh, you know, a biography of David Niven, books on Buddhism, various different things. And um, yeah, it's been very nice to just be a reader and not think of myself as a writer in any way. And uh, I, do, I do feel, it, in, I have never tried my blood pressure after it, but I think compared to Twitter, it's probably a lot healthier um, for my cardiovascular system as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to go to William Jeremy, who's had his uh, hand up for a while. William, I don't do that. I would like to. Excellent. Um, Matt, you've uh, said all sorts of, both Matts, you've said all sorts of extraordinary things. And uh, I just wanted to ask both of you, in fact, about the, uh, the language of mental health, which... Uh, which uh, we've been talking about and how it changes. I mean, I've been involved in mental health issues on and off for a fair time now, starting from disability affairs way back in the 90s uh, with a little disability radio uh, affairs radio program down in South Wales I was involved with. But I too have suffered from anxiety and depression like many people have but funnily enough the lockdown had been at the start of the lockdown was the source of um my recovery from the last few years of on off uh uh difficulties and the world slowing down somehow mm. helped and what you say about reading is bang on as well i've i've I've, uh, you know, read uh, um, perhaps twice as much as I would have done in a four month period of time. And you can take much solace from mm. that as well. And so uh, if there was one uh, phrase, if you like, that encompassed a, uh, an evolving mm. mental health change of language, it might be something around changing the way we think about the past present particularly because a lot of what we think about time and the passage of time and regret and things we haven't done we tend to forget that we can only put our lives together meaningfully in retrospect because nothing makes sense unless it's in retrospect the things we did the things we didn't do the things we might have done uh, are sort of kind of all bound up and of course you know this more than most having written a book called how to stop time so which is brilliant as a title and as a book by the way matt so oh. so just a few observations about that from both yeah. both no. if that makes any sense 
It does, absolutely. Good observations. And I, I yeah, I, I think that is true, basically. Um, it, you know, the idea that we are continually in a present, but that present, how well we live inside that present depends on how much we are swamped by the past or fearful of the future and how much we can free ourselves. Although I suppose that's the fundamental thing of the um, human condition, isn't it? But yeah, I, and I think the other thing about regret is we can never, just as we can't know the future, we don't always quite know the past. We're always fictionalizing our own story and how things happened in the past. And we, we think our memory is more reliable than it is. Uh, and, and so all we really know is what we have in front of us um, to go on. But it, 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 you know, it's some, something I, I struggle with. So even though I write about it a lot, I write about it because it's something I'm trying to work out myself too, rather than have all of the answers. Brilliant. Um, could we come to Anna next, please? Um, who had a very good question about media. Um, Anna, I don't know if you're there. Hi, Anna. Hi, uh, yeah, um, I think it was it was a while ago that I asked that question. Um, I think I was saying about um, uh, the fact that the media often only lets people talk uh, about their mental health, or I feel they're only allowed to talk about their mental health when they're kind of on the other side of it. Um, they've come out the other end and they can provide this inspirational story, which is obviously really great for, for everyone to hear. But I think it does cause a reluctance for people to speak out whilst it's happening um and for those going through it you know sometimes doesn't provide the most accurate representation of what they're feeling in that moment um and i just wondered yeah i guess whether um it's a good good or bad thing to kind of um have that representation of people who are might be struggling in that moment yeah no, i definitely think it would be good um i, I you know and that's why i try not so much in my books, but, um, you know, online, I try, I try and be honest about, you know, bad mental health days and stuff. Now I've become this sort of uh, mental health spokesperson, I suppose. Um, I try, you know, when I'm talking about mental health to not always use the past tense to actually, you know, see mental health as this ongoing thing, this garden we have to continually attend to, just as we do with physical health. And uh, I try to be very honest about that. Obviously, when we're in a state of um, depression, we like to hear of people who, who, are, who are going through similar and surviving it. And we also like to hear of people who've been there or been to an even worse place and got quite a bit better from that. So we, we like to, you know, we like to believe in change and um, hope because for me again as well as regret one of the symptoms was feeling very stuck in the moment very like this was going to be all moments and I think that's what really got me into um, stories obviously I was into novels um, before I had my breakdown and I'd done English at university and stuff but um, I, I got into proper old-fashioned stories with beginnings middles and ends and you know it didn't even have to be happy stories it didn't have to be happy endings but I was into the idea of change all of a sudden I think one of the reasons we like stories is because we like to believe in change and personal growth and personal change you know for a story to be a story something has to change the situation or a character or something and so we like hearing that in our examples of mental health too but you're absolutely right that I, I think it is much more we talk about having the mental health conversation and oh look how far we've come in the last 20 years in terms of talking about mental health and we are definitely yabbering on about mental health a lot more but I sometimes wonder if we're talking about it um, in in very easy and very superficial ways. And we, we could actually, you know, we, we need to evolve the conversation, I think, to actually talk about, you know, it's very easy to say you're absolutely okay and you wouldn't stigmatize anyone with depression or anxiety or bipolar or borderline personality disorder. But when you're actually dealing with someone going through um, that, then um, it's a very different story. We see this a lot, of course, with celebrities online, or, or, on, on Twitter or something. If, if a celebrity is having what clearly looks like an episode, um, and then the same people who, who retweet about mental health awareness and whatever are, are the first to sort of judge and chastise someone who, who might not be in their best state of mind. So yeah, a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of things we, we need to do to grow, I think. 
Thanks, Mac. Uh, could we come to Russell now? I think Russell had a... a <laughs> Russell, well being you there. Hi, Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to say, firstly, that uh, I'm hugely honoured to be asking that question. I consider myself quite well read, uh, and The Humans is my favourite novel of all time. Oh, oh, I, gave, I gave it to uh, I gave it to my girlfriend on our first ever date to be like, Look, you have to read this book. Uh, it, it's it's amazing. Um, I also want to say you, you mentioned being a, sm a spokesperson for mental health, and I just wanted to let you know I've been I only really started using Twitter in lockdown, and you have been an amazing spokesperson for mental health, and I think that is is amazing. Uh, as a teacher, we always had to bear in mind that we could never know the impact that our words were having on our students. Uh, we just had to trust that if we said the right things and did the right things, that maybe 40 years down the line, those words would echo and resonate in those students' heads. They might not remember who said them, but it would still be helping them in their life. And you can never know the full extent of that impact. But the question I have for you is how can we make sure that, or how can the edu, so, you uh, part of your work has inspired me to create my own organization uh believe in better education uh, and i'd love to get a quote from you to say how we can make sure within the education system how do we promote mental health how do we make sure that we can make understanding mental health something we deliver and educate students on well i don't know if i'll have a snappy off the cuff Quite, but my general thought on that, I mean, I'm from a family of teachers as well. My, my mum was a head teacher for about 30 years. And my sister was a teacher, um, or still, still is a teacher. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think basically, like with all things, I don't think it, it, it should necessarily be treated as a separate subject. You know, me mental health is integral to everything and to everything we do. And, and it, it has to be integral, I think, to the education system as well. And we need to factor in mental well-being into our conversations of physical well-being and learning and growth. You know, what is the point of an education system? Is it just a grade machine or is it also about creating confident, um, happy, healthy people and um obviously it has to factor that in as well so yeah i, I think i think we you know I, I don't normally like the word but we do need a sort of holistic approach um to mental health and education and it can't just be oh, oh it's three o'clock on a wednesday afternoon so it's the mental health hour i think i think we need a, a, a full picture approach thank you very much thanks Matt. Uh, can we come to kira uh, if she's there Kira Upton, um, are you are you are you with us? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, it's quite dark in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can see you. Okay. Uh, welcome. Hiya. Uh, fire away. Um. So my point was about as a young person, there's a lot of pressure um, on social media just to sort of be an activist for every cause, I guess, and it's all about um, kind of jumping into things without really understanding them, but trying not to be labelled as like, um, not, act how do I describe this? Um, I, I think as, I know what you're saying. Yeah, so basically not to be, there's a whole like concept about being actively anti something. And it's almost like if you don't um, sort of use your education and your knowledge on a, on a subject to educate other people, then you're, you are living up to that, um, that notion, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, obviously, I, I haven't been a young person in this era, so I, I can imagine that. And I can imagine, but even even as any any person active on the internet, you kind of feel that sort of silent pressure that there are certain issues that you 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 have an obligation to speak about. You know, if you're at all in the public eye uh, at all, you know, if you've got any eyes on you at all, you feel like, oh, oh, are they going to think I haven't had an instant opinion on you know it's like we've got to be opinion machines and we've got to you know be hashtag machines and continually um supporting things and, and this goes back to the point about reading you know there's not enough time to reflect and absorb and step away from interactivity and, and to actually get your th thoughts formed it's almost like it's not we're not allowed to say i don't know you know we have to plan one side or the other on every arguments and it's kind of exhausting and it, it can't be doing us or society that much good and it creates a very 
binary polarized situation uh, especially on twitter obviously um i don't i don't really have any of the answers to that but i do see it as a as a, as a problem um yeah so that's obviously something you felt very much kira is it that you you you, you know you, you feel obliged to tweet or do put something out there but you don't actually know what your your opinion is necessarily exactly yeah 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 me too me too <laughs> Matt, Matt, I wanted to ask you a, a question about fiction, um, which is that I think uh, um, I'm a little bit older than you, but it's kind of similar sort of, you know, growing up with Jeanette Winston and Ian McEwen and Martin Amis and some of those quite yeah. heavily wrought prose stylists. Um, and what's interesting is that reading your stuff, it's obvious that one of the writers that helped open the door to you becoming a writer was Graham Greene. who yes. seemed to be able to deal with, you know, huge issues of morality and religion and faith and so on. Um, and I just wonder as, as time has passed, who, you know, are there kind of writers that when you look out the window there, you're there, the mountain range, or is it much more subtle on that? Well, I mean, Graham Greene's still up there. I mean, I've got loads, you know, I've got Emily Dickinson. I always have to name check Jeanette Winston because she is a great writer, but also she got me in through the door. Uh, she was, a, a, I contacted her. She was a very early adopter of the internet and she had a website, a very good website. She interacted with people back in 2003, 2002. And I contacted her and asked her to read a thousand words and uh, by chance she did actually read it and she came back with loads of constructive criticism and she was really helpful. So I always have to mention Jeanette for, you know, I, and she eventually showed my first novel to my first editor as well. So I really do owe my career to her. So I have to mention her. Um, Graham Greene, I love. I studied, I did a master's degree at Leeds University in English literature and there was a module on Graham Greene and I was the only student who took the Graham Greene module. And I don't think the tutor particularly warmed to me or, you know, so it was a very awkward hour we'd have every um, Thursday. Um, but no, I, I love Graham Greene. And I, I, I like him because, you know, a lot of people are put off because there's a lot of guilt in there, a lot of Catholic stuff and a lot of shame and all of that. And, and I, kind of, I love the intensity. I like, I like writers whose books have an instant feeling. And he, he's definitely one of those. He also does a, a great, neat, I won't get too geeky about it, but he, he, he does a great um, neat trick continually where he, he uses simile and metaphor a lot. So he would take um, something abstract or um, solid and then compare it to something abstract. So like in um, The Power and the Glory, he talks about the whiskey priest um, drinking um, the whiskey down like damnation. And, and he just had a very simple, dramatic way of making a simple gesture into something of biblical proportions. I, 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 and I love that. Um, all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, 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 used, I was a teenage Stephen King fan, still admire Stephen King's ability and imagination. Um, a lot of poetry, Emily Dickinson. Um, uh, what, what am I reading at the moment? Borges, we mentioned Borges, and um, Borges was a great influence on the Midnight Library in particular. He's a great, you know, if, if you're stuck for ideas, you know, read a little bit of Borges and, uh, and your mind starts bubbling. Italo Calvino, all, all, all kinds of people. Yes, I, I, I'm always a bit rubbish at that question because you, you can go in any direction, but yes. Oh, no, there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are infinite, I mean, like in the library, it's an infinite <laughs> library doesn't have a uh, you know single shelf. Um, I'd like, if I may, to come to my colleague Liv Lee, who is a huge fan of yours, um, and I think just uh, would would love to join in. Liv. Hi, Liv. Hello, so lovely to meet you. I'm not allowed to ask questions because it's a thinking. So I'm going to do two roundabout ways. Uh, so, two of my most favourite books by you are the Humans and the Radleys which are both books about characters hiding who they are. Yes. Um, and is that something that when you were writing was kind of part of your mental health or... Yeah. Because when, you're, when you have mental health, you are hiding who you are. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, 
definitely. Uh, I, I felt that particularly with the Radleys. Um, for those who haven't read it, the Radleys is about vampires, um, but not your Twilight kind of vampires. It, it, it is a very suburban, very middle class, Radio 4 listening kind of vampires and they're abstaining as well and 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 so they but they're, they're continually trying to keep a lid on it and the teenage daughter turns vegan and then all hell breaks loose and um that was that was fun but yes I, I at that point in time i was having a little mental health dip we'd just moved to the suburbs i was worried about leaving my youth behind i was having anxiety and all kinds of things so yeah, that's the great thing about writing fiction. You can actually be very honest about your own life situation while also writing about vampires or aliens. And I think certainly that's, that, that's the overriding uh, memory I've got from my really dark days of depression is that feeling of being a fish out of water. You, people will talk to you as if you're this normal, healthy, 26 year old person as I was then and you know look like you've got nothing wrong with you and yet your head will be on fire and that's you know it's horrible to live through but there's also a kind of comedy to it as well it's a kind of dark comedy you know fish out of water being a staple one of the comedy staples and you continually that um fish out of water so often I have characters who are outsiders but they don't look like they're outsiders so even when I wrote about an 800 year old man in How to Stop Time, he, he looked like he was a, a middle-aged um, secondary school teacher, so yeah. I loved both, so um, is it all right if I, my daughter is called Evie and received for Christmas, Evie and the Animals. So I have to not ask, but what made you come up with the name Evie? She loves it, it's the best. Uh, that's good, I don't actually know any real life Evie's. So I think possibly that reason. I, I was probably waiting for your Evie. I, I think, um, I, I, I don't know. I wrote the book for my daughter, but she's not called Evie. She's called Pearl. Um, and, I, you know, I'd written a book for my son, which was a boy called Christmas, because um, my son had asked me what Father Christmas was like as a boy. And then I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll go and write that, that, that down. Um, but I, I, so I then had to, so they didn't have issues in later life, um, seeing their therapist about sibling rivalry. I then had to go to my daughter and ask her what I wanted her to write, what she wanted me to write about for her. And um, she just said animals. So I thought, okay, we've just got to have animals in the title. And so she wanted a girl who, a sort of female Dr. Doolittle type character. And, and I don't know why I got Evie. But um, yes, I like it. I like the name. It's a good name, cool name. Thank you. It's so <laughs> amazing to meet you. Thank you very much. Oh, you. Thanks. You too. Matt, um, uh, one, a line I remember writing down uh, several years ago now, I guess it must be five, five years ago when uh, Reasons came out, which is um, where talk exists, so does hope, um, which is incredibly powerful. And and seems to me to run through everything you write in different ways. Can you talk about how that maybe applies to the novel, that principle, that the, 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 this kind of discourse that you're engaged in is, yeah. is an optimistic one? Yes, no, definitely. And I, I you know, the first three novels I ever wrote, um, you know, I don't, I don't hate them, but I, they are quite bleak and the outlook was quite bleak and uh, they have pessimistic endings. And in one of them in particular, I wrote a book, which hardly anyone's read, um, called The Possession of Mr. Cave. And literally, it, you know, everything bad that could happen. It's almost like depression as a novel, you know, and it, it's a total tragedy all the way through. And I got to the end of that and I felt totally flat after writing that. And I thought if, if I'm actually privileged enough to be putting something out into the world, something creative out into the world. Why, why do I want to you know, depress people? Why do I want to depress myself? Why, why is serious fiction always seen as pessimistic fiction? You know, why can't we actually try a bit harder to find some kind of optimism, some kind of authentic hope, not, not sort of corny tea towel hope, but actually something real that comes from the sort of dark places. And, you know, I think the, the Radleys, but then The Humans was the first book I properly wrote, which I felt was a, a me book, which was exactly what I wanted to write when I wanted to write it. And it's not definitely not a perfect book. I don't even think it's my best book, but it, it was the first time I wrote as myself, properly as myself, get, shaking off all the sort of younger pretentiousness and, and, and just wrote for me. And 
uh, I, I think, you know, there are no endings, but uh, there are no necessarily happy endings, but there are continual open endings. And I think the ultimate happy ending for me is an open ending where you can go in any direction. But simply the act of writing for me, just like the act of reading is an act of therapy itself. I, I genuinely think that it's a way to find out who you are, uh, whether you're writing literally about your life or writing about um, aliens in a far off universe, you are still writing from yourself, from your imagination. So you're, you're kind of being like a journalist of the imagination and you're jotting down things which are true, always true in the sense that they come from you and they come from your imagination. And I think there's a, always a kind of therapy and a kind of joy to that. And I think that doesn't change. I think wherever you are in your career as a writer, um, you have to keep excited about the actual process of writing. I suppose it's like being a musician or whatever, isn't it? Or being a chef. You have to stay, you know, you, you, you should only do it if you actually enjoy the act of doing it. And, uh, you know, that first draft for me, when you're discovering new ideas and, and, and surprising yourself and not everything's been planned out, and uh, that itself is a kind of therapy and a pleasurable thing to do. And, and sticking with that theme of talk, um, I mean, the, you know, an obvious and I think slightly glib conclusion would be that Nora is just an avatar for you. But yeah. I suspect, and I'd love to hear if I'm right, that you were really in a dialogue with her when you wrote this book. Yeah, I suppose, you know, in a way, another glib answer is every character you write is you. You know, it's a, it's a different, you're having yeah. continual, continual dialogues with these made up figures in your head. And um, yeah, Nora, I think Nora's path is quite similar to mine in the sense that she's a character who goes from feeling life is happening to her to being a character where she realizes she has more agency than she previously thought. And I think that is what empowerment is about on your own sort of individual level. Um, it's about realizing that yes, life isn't certain, you can't control all those things, you can't control your own circumstances, yet you do still have an agency. You have an agency, if nothing else, in how you respond to those things. Even within the hell of depression or mental illness, you have, you, you might not be able to stop depression, but there are things you can do in terms of your response to the thing. So, um, you know, I, and it's very similar to me because I used to call myself a depressive. I used to say, I'm a depressive. I used to literally say, it, even before I was diagnosed with depression, I'd say, oh, I'm a depressive. And it's like, I wasn't, you know, no one is a depressive. You are someone who has depression. You're someone who experiences depression. But when you say, I have depression, that I is separate. So I, I prefer to see life and those sort of mental experiences or like weather which happens to us rather than things we are. And I think Nora's path uh, in the book is very much from thinking she is the source of all the problems um, to realizing she actually has some power and some agency over her life. She doesn't need a magic wand um, to get to a better place. And just sort of to finish with a kind of more topic, you know, topical thing, which is, you know, we're going through as a species, let alone as a country, and <laughs> you know, an extraordinary, you know, weather is the word. I mean, it's a kind of experience where we're all subject to changes that and and pressures that are not of our making. Um, and and mental health has been such a big part of the debate. And the question, I suppose, I, I wanted to ask you was with the novel and, 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 and with your experience of what's happened in the last few months, do, do you feel, are, are you in good cheer about where we're heading? Are you uncertain? I'm obviously uncertain, but is your general sense that, that this has been something from which constructive outcomes may emerge? Um, well, I hope so. I mean, certainly on an individual micro level in my life, I definitely think there will be things I take away from this year um, and have value. I, I think we've, we've done a lot of philosophizing um, as a species and individually, uh, uh, and we've had a lot of time to reflect on things. And I think the big thing is realizing there was a lot in terms of how we were living before, which 
we, we massively miss. And then there's a lot we didn't miss at all. And that, that, what those things are changes from person to person, I'm sure. But I, I feel like this year, the one hopeful thing that can come out of it could be a kind of mass psychic decluttering where we actually try and reassess what really is important and what we have in common and yes this year has seen all kinds of political upheavals and divisions and tensions and stuff but hopefully you know th th these are just sort of like the growing pains and hopefully we do find something shared and collective about this experience um, because it has been a, a, one of those rare collective experiences hasn't it where we are actually going through something together and, and, which is very different to how we've been living in a very atomized way very individualistic way we're now realizing we're actually part of the same world and we we can literally infect and affect each other the psychic decluttering seems a, a perfect phrase <laughs> to end and and to that end um I, I'd, I'd like to urge everyone here to read uh, Matt's amazing book. There's a link to it in the, the, the chat. Um, if you haven't got a copy, do pick, do yourself a favour and pick one up. It really is a fantastic read, and I guarantee you, you'll get a great deal out of it. But Matt, thank you so much for sparing us your time. It's been an absolute joy. I could carry on talking to you all evening, but I wish you all the best with the book, and we hope to see you again soon. And please, thank you everyone for coming and join me in um, in, in waving. Matt, as, as the, best, the closest we can come to, to thanking him for, for, for a wonderful experience. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Right. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers. That was lovely. Lovely to see you all. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.